Yes, sir. You know, uh, there are those who've done that. In fact, somebody was telling me, yeah, you're telling me that uh, part of a church plant where that happened, and it presents some challenges. Uh, it presents challenges, not because it's not a good book, but first of all, it's narrative. Secondly, you're dealing with, um, you're dealing with themes that aren't immediately, uh, in, in every case, applicable to the congregation. So you just, you know, it, it's, it's depending on your own situation. I wouldn't say Acts is a, is a, no, you should never preach that when you go into a church, but I wouldn't say it's a slam dunk either, personally. All right, well, let's move on then. We're, we're moving on to the, the next stage, observation. As we look at exegesis, studying the biblical text, we looked at preparation, preparing yourself, your surroundings, choosing a book. Now we move on to observation. And observation is really the heart of exegesis. This is where we do the hard work, the spade work, to mine uh, an understanding of the text itself. Exegesis is, is using your careful reading, thought, and analysis, along with all of the available tools to systematically study the details of the text in order to arrive at its meaning. It answers the question, observation does, what does this really say? That's where you're going. At this point, your primary goal isn't how does this apply. It, it isn't even yet you've made a final interpretive decision. We'll do that in interpretation. This is, I need to understand what this text, what this passage actually says. You have to go there before you can go to what it means. You have to look at the constituent parts that are there to discern what it's really saying. Jim Shaddix, in his book, The Passion Driven Sermon, writes this. Several years ago, one of the great Bible expositors of our day was teaching a pastor's training school on the value of using various Bible study tools for sermon preparation. During a discussion time, a young man posed an important question to him. Sir, he asked, don't you think it's important for me just to get alone with God and find out what the Holy Spirit is saying to me? The preacher's answer was shocking. Young man, he replied, I'm not interested in what the Holy Spirit is saying to you. In fact, you may be surprised to know that I'm not interested in what the Holy Spirit is saying to me. Then he explained, all I'm interested in is what the Holy Spirit is saying, and the Holy Spirit has been saying the same thing through a passage of Scripture since the day he inspired it. And I'm going to use every available means that I have to find out what that is. That's where you are. You're looking for the authorial intent. Ultimately, not even the biblical author, the man, but the Spirit who moved that man along to record both the thoughts of God in the words of God. And so um, this is what we're trying to do. What does this say? What is the Holy Spirit saying in this passage? And it's the same thing he's been saying since the day he inspired it. Now, unfortunately, this has not always been the, the approach, the basic Grammatical historical approach has not always been the pattern of the church. There are many ancient sermons, interpretations, as you know, that are allegorical. Origen was um, one of the chief sources of this. They see in every passage different levels of meaning. For example, here's one example. They would say the city of Jerusalem, every reference in Scripture to the city of Jerusalem has four levels of meaning. Every time you come across... Jerusalem, it, they would say, has a literal meaning, speaking of the historical city. It has an allegorical meaning, speaking of the church. It has a moral meaning, speaking of the human soul. And it has an eschatological meaning, speaking of the heavenly Jerusalem. Well, you can see why Luther said what he said about allegory. when he called it a beautiful harlot that appeals to the idol. Because... You know, you can, you can sound really profound doing this, but you're violating the, the basic principle of all written communication. As a rule, it has one basic meaning. Yes, there are times when a writer will intentionally use a, a, a word that has a double meaning to it, but that's the exception rather than the rule. 
And there are examples of that, I believe, in Scripture. But by and large, any given passage has one meaning, the meaning the Spirit intended. As you know, with the Reformation, a new day dawned, not only for the doctrines of salvation, but also for the the treatment of the Word of God. I shared this with you yesterday, but I want to share these two quotes again, and I want to have them on the slides so that you can, when you get the notes, you'll, you'll have these, because I love these quotes. Luther said, The Holy Ghost is the all-simplest writer that is in heaven or earth. Therefore, his words can have no more than one simplest sense, which we call the scriptural or the literal meaning. John Calvin said, It is the first business of an interpreter to let the author say what he does say rather rather than attributing to him what we think he ought to say. So how do we approach this process of observation. The key word is we do it systematically. Systematically. I love the way Luther put it. He said, first I shake the whole tree that the ripest fruit may fall. Then I climb the tree and shake each limb and then each branch and then each twig and then I look under each leaf. You get the idea. He starts with the large and comes down to an understanding of the specifics. I, I've written this over here because, and really I've, I should put something even above the book, and that is um, the scripture as a whole is composed of various books, 66 books, depending of course on how they're, they're divided. There's a lot of debate about that, but for our purposes, 66 books. Then, so here's how you're thinking. When you come to study a passage, and this is what Luther was saying, and I, I think he's absolutely right. When you come to study a passage, you start with the macro view. You start with, okay, what is, what is the basic theme of Scripture as a whole? Then I'm looking at how does each book relate back to that overall theme of Scripture? I'm going to deal with the theme of Scripture in a moment, but... But you're looking, you've got to get that big picture. Every time, every time you're looking at a paragraph of text to preach, you cannot lose sight of the larger picture of where it fits. Or you're going to explain it out of its context. You have to start with the scripture as a whole. Where, where does this book that I'm now in, how does it connect to the overall theme of scripture and the flow of, of redemptive history? Then, as you begin to look at that book, you want to ask yourself, so what's the theme of this book? What's the overall single intention the Spirit had in giving this book? While there may be a number of sub-themes, almost without exception, I would say, there is a comprehensive theme to each book. And uh, you used to, I think, you still have the, like the ordination practicum class where you have to memorize all the book themes. Th- that's what I'm talking about. There is, a, there is a, a theme related to each book that relates back to the overall theme of Scripture. That's where you start. You're not ready to study a book until you've come up with what that theme of that book is and how it relates back to the overall context of Scripture. Then, now you're going to look in the book. You know what the theme of the book is? Your next objective is to look at the major divisions within that book, usually encompassing numbers of chapters, and depending on how big the book is. I mean, if it's a small little epistle, if it's, if it's you know, Second John, that's not true. But ordinarily, a book like Romans, for example, you're looking at where does that book break down into major divisions? Where are there major changes of thought? Here's here's a large division that's driving home one point. Here's another large division that's driving home a different point. And here's another large division that's driving home yet a third point. And then how, what's the theme of each of those divisions? And how does it relate back to the theme of the book as a whole? This is what Luther's saying. And that's why I think the statement itself is, is brilliant. Because this is what we have to do. This is what we are doing, is we're, we're starting big, and then we're gradually working our way down. 
So when I come to a book study, when I came to Romans a couple years ago, I started with, okay, I know I, I have fixed in my own mind the theme of Scripture, why Scripture exists, how the Old Testament and the New Testament relate to that theme. So then I'm asking myself, so what is the theme of the book of Romans? And then, once that's decided, I'm looking at where are the major divisions within that book, the, the major changes of thought within that larger book, and what's the theme of each of those divisions? And how does that theme relate back to the theme of the book? Then when I come to the major divisions, now I'm going to go down a little further here. I'm going to come and say, okay, each major division then consists of sections. We're not yet at the paragraph level. We're still looking at bodies of verses that are larger than a paragraph, but fit within this main division. There are sections, and I'm, we're going to go through Romans. I'll show you this sort of fleshed out, but, but I want you to get the big picture here first. So there are sections then within that major division, and again, I want to break down those sections. Where are they? Where are the minor changes in thought that still aren't paragraphs, but mark changes in, in thought that are still reinforcing the theme of that major division? And how are they reinforcing the theme of that major division? And then finally, I want to look at a given section, and I want to say, okay, what are the paragraphs in that section? And how do those paragraphs, what's the theme of each paragraph, and how do the, does the theme of each of those paragraphs relate back to the section? This is exposition. Before you're ready to do a, a a sentence diagram in your Greek text, or a block diagram, which is what I'm going to encourage you to consider, you have to think like this. You have to look at that book. When I'm, before I ever step into the pulpit to preach one verse of Romans, I've done this. At least with the first several major divisions. I haven't yet done it all the way to the, the final chapters of, of Romans, although I have a pretty good idea. But I have fleshed this out through at least the first major division, through chapter 3, verse 20, and for the most part, further into the book. So I, I got that. But I've done at least the major divisions of the whole book, and I've got a pretty good idea of the sections within those major divisions before I ever step into the pulpit to preach once. Because then I know I've got my arms around Romans. I know where we're going. I may not understand what's under each each leaf yet. I'm going to learn. We all do in the process of our study, but I, I've, I've got the tree. I know where the tree is, and I know where the major, the major limbs are, and, and I know where the, the branches are for the most part. And now I'm going to get into the, the, the little twigs and the, the leaves. Yeah. Yeah, no, not entirely. I'll talk about that in a minute. But I, there is a place for going to the commentators to help with this. Not to do it, again, I would always encourage you to do it first on your own, but back to that evaluation is, is just to check. You know, where sometimes there'll be a troublesome one. You know, there's a, there's, it's like, I don't know if that goes there or there. I'm struggling with that. You can look at a couple of commentators you trust then and see where they're coming from, what their thoughts are, and evaluate that. But again, I always encourage you to do your own spade work first. So we're going to talk about how to get there with this. But most of this comes through the read-throughs that you've done already. In that process, you ought to be doing this in your mind. Okay? Any, any further questions? Okay. So systematically. Now, what are you looking for in the observation stage? Or to put it another way, what are you trying to observe? This is observation. What is it we're after? Well, as you know, we follow the grammatical historical approach to Scripture. Our goal is to discern the author's original meaning. And his original meaning, this is really important to understand, his original meaning can only be discerned by understanding his grammar using the normal principles that are used with all literature. It's not like we approach the Bible differently in that sense. You interpret the Bible 
The same way you interpret the newspaper or a website you read, you use the same basic principles of interpre- interpretation that you do with, with any other writing. A letter you receive, an email you get, the same basic principles. And then, of course, the, the historical side of it is you can only understand fully his grammar and his syntax if you put that within the context of his times and you understand the, the sort of the circumstances in, from which he wrote and into which he wrote. So in observation then, here's what we're looking to observe. We're looking first of all at context. Context in two specific ways. We're looking at historical context. That is, we're looking at the setting of the book in human history. Now, for example, uh, to really appreciate what 1 Peter has to say, you have to understand the historical context in which he wrote. What was that? Well, he's talking about standing firm in the midst of suffering. Why? Why would Peter be writing to a group of, of Jews scattered around the empire about standing firm through suffering? Well, because this is not long after the rising tide of Roman persecution caused by Nero's blaming the burning of Rome on the Christians. And with that came a fresh onslaught of not merely localized persecution, but persecution at a larger level uh, across the empire. Of course, it was more intense in certain pockets, just as it is even in our country today. But, but nevertheless, there is that context. When you know that historical context, you're better able to interpret the, the, the book. So that's one of the things you're looking for as you go through this. Okay? Um, another example, First and Second Samuel, particularly First Samuel. Why, uh, but, but really into Second Samuel as well, why would that be important? Why would it be important for the interplay and the interaction between Saul and David to be recorded in that time period, those circumstances? Well, what had just begun in, in chapter 9 of 1 Samuel? The monarchy, okay? What, by definition, is a monarchy? What differentiates a monarchy from, say, our form of government? There's one ruler, and how does that ruler, how is he chosen? How is, how is a king normally chosen? He's, I don't mean the first one now. I'm talking about subsequent to the first one. Lineage. He's, he's in the dynasty of the kings. He's the offspring of the previous king. Well, now think about this. You've got Saul, picked by the people, affirmed by God, and he's the king. What should happen in a monarchy? His son should be king. But the very second king of Israel isn't his son. Now, if you're living in those times, you're not at the palace. You don't know what happened. What are you thinking may have happened? Foul play. It's like David has, you know, he's a usurper. God chose Saul. And so 1 Samuel defends the change of dynasties. You see that David, not only did he not do anything to usurp the place of Saul, he did everything exactly the opposite of that. And it defends that he was a man after God's own heart, that he was not some intruder into the office, that he was the man God chose. And the reason God chose him was because of Saul's pattern of sin and rebellion against God. So you see what I'm saying? The, the historical context really sets a backdrop for understanding the, the book in a profound way. So this becomes what we're looking for when we're looking in historical con- at um, context, historical context. Secondly, we're also looking at biblical context. That is the relationship of the paragraph or the section or the division to the surrounding passages, to the rest of the book, 
and to the entire message of Scripture. We are we're looking at context in observation. Whether it's words, for example, you're doing a word study of a word in your passage, you're looking to see how that word fits into the context of the rest of the book and to the rest of Scripture. And that brings us to content. Not only are we looking at context, but we're looking at content as well in, in observation. And in content, we're primarily looking at two things. We're looking at syntax. That is simply the relationship of phrases and clauses to one another, even the relationship of words to one another. So we're looking then at how the author in the original language, or if you're using a, a good English text, how the author has related those words and phrases to one another. That's syntax. And that's where meaning is found. Meaning is not found in individual words isolated from each other because words have different senses. Meaning is found in the relationship of words and phrases and clauses to each other. That's syntax. This is what we're looking for. And then secondly, in content, we're looking at the words themselves. We're looking at the various senses of a given word, how that word is used in the rest of that section or the rest of that book, how that word is used in Scripture as a whole. Um, and then we have to ask ourselves, okay, there are six senses that this word can have. Which one is the one the author intended in this context? And we'll, we'll deal with uh, how, to, how to discern that. Spurgeon quoting a writer that he had read, said this, most read their Bibles like cows that stand in thick grass and they trample under their feet the finest flowers and herbs. <laughs> I love that. In other words, most people don't get down to enough detail to really appreciate the beauty of what's there. They just sort of trample across the thick grass and, you know, get the big picture. We must never hurry the step of observation. This is the, the really the heart of our work as, as students of Scripture, as men of God, as preachers. If we hurry this step, we'll miss the beauty, we'll miss the richness and the depth of the Word of God uh, because there is so much. I, I am always amazed. Um, I, I heard John at one point say, and, and I, it stuck with me, and I see this every week in my study. You know, he was talking about what has struck him from all of his years of study, all of those hours in the, in the scripture. And he said, two things stand out. One is that God is amazing. And the second is that I'm amazed. That's, that's how I feel every week when I study. I mean, you've had this, this experience. You go to a text and let's just be honest. We've all, we've all said this in our minds, not very loudly, but well, I really wish I weren't preaching this text this week. There's not much here. And then you get into it. Okay, maybe I'm the only person that's felt that, but I've felt that. And you get into it, and it's like, wow. I had no idea. Doesn't that make sense? If this is the mind of God, if this, this is the thoughts of God, then what makes us think with a cursory reading we can descend into the level of the depth of his meaning? And so... Um, don't hurry the step of observation. So let's consider then the process of observation. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start really big, bigger than most of us probably need. Just bear with me. We're not going to spend long here. We're going to get to the specifics of what you need to do. But I think it is important. The first step in observation is to remember the big picture. Remember the big picture of the book you're dealing with and what it's about. The big picture, first of all, noting the Bible's history, written over 1,500 years from the writings of Moses in 1445 B.C. to about 95 A.D. with the last book of the New Testament, something in that basic time frame. Over 40 different authors, 66 books, 39 in the Old Testament, 27 in the New Testament. By the way, 40 different authors, who's the only, well, this is a trick question, there are actually two Gentile writers of Scripture, but one of them only wrote a chapter. Who's that? Nebuchadnezzar. Okay. But who's the other Gentile writer of Scripture? Luke. Here's the real irony of that. 
If you look at the volume of the New Testament, Luke wrote far more of the New Testament than Paul did. If you look at the volume of material, it's incredible, you know, just to see how the Lord put it together. I think you have to keep that in mind as you approach it. Also, keep in mind the Bible's process. And again, these are, this is really basic for you guys, but but God command, commanded men he chose to write his words in the original autographs. We don't have those. Copies of the originals and then copies of the copies were meticulously made. So you see this sort of pattern through the years. What about today? And this is important to assure your congregation. I just did this recently, assuring my, my congregation, because they'll hear this, this stuff like, well, we don't really know what the historical Jesus said. That's a ridiculous statement. Okay, that does not stand up to history. Today, there are more than 25,000 manuscripts with a portion of the New Testament. There are Greek manuscripts, or 5,700 or so of those. There are early translations, for example, Latin and Coptic, Syriac, etc. And then you have the quotations of the early church fathers. In fact, some, have, some scholars have estimated that we could piece together the entirety of the New Testament, even if we didn't have the 5,700 Greek manuscripts, solely from the quotations in the early church fathers. So we have a plethora of material that's reliable and reflects the original. You know, when you look at the Bible's authenticity, um, historically, as, as I mentioned a moment ago, we have more manuscript copies of the Bible than any other ancient document. 5,700 Greek manuscripts of the New Testament, for example. The, the second closest number of manuscripts of an ancient document that we have, the Iliad, with 643. In addition to that, the biblical manuscripts date closer to the originals, when the originals were written, than any other ancient document we possess. The time gap between the original documents and the earliest manuscripts of, say, the Iliad, 400 years. In other words, the, the oldest copy we have of the Iliad was, written four, was copied 400 years after the original was written. With the New Testament, some of you have seen it as I have, the Rylands Papyrus. The Rylands Papyrus is a fragment of John's gospel that dates within 25 to 30 years of his writing that document. That is incredible in terms of ancient documents. And of course... With, with complete books of the scripture, within a hundred years of when they were written, we have manuscripts that exist, and the entire New Testament, um, we have copies of most of the entire New Testament within a hundred to 150 years. Uh, dating varies a little bit, but you get the idea. Compare that. It's, don't let anybody tell your people and make sure they know this information that we have. They may disagree with what the, the manuscripts say. Okay, we can deal with that. But don't come forward with a ridiculous argument that we can't be sure that what we have is even what the apostles wrote. You know, I asked a, ask a person like that one time. I said, so do you study any of the ancient, any ancient literature in college? Oh, yeah, Plato, Aristotle. I said, well, I just don't believe they wrote those things. And, of course, they begin to give you the argument. And then you bring this in. You say, that's, you know, your bias. You're treating the Bible differently than any other ancient document. So don't lose sight of this as you approach the Scripture. I just think it's encouraging, it's helpful. Also, when you look at the Bible's the authenticity, that it is what it claims to be, theologically, why do we embrace it? If I were to ask you, why do you believe that those 66 books are God's inspired word, what would you say? There are a lot of different answers we could give, right? I think the most important one, personally, is, has nothing to do with the church councils. The church councils merely affirmed what the church had already affirmed. In fact, if you're interested in a, in a, in a read that will sort of set your mind on this, read, uh, there are two books I'd recommend. One is by Michael Kruger called The Question of Canon. He deals with some of those sort of contemporary arguments out there uh, that, that say that, you know, the early church wasn't into writing and, you know, all those things that, that liberals and others throw at us. It's a, it's a very helpful little book. But marry that with another one. It was book of the year when it was written back in the 
oh, I'm guessing 60s, I don't remember now, um, a book by R. Laird Harris called uh, Inspiration, The Inspiration and Canonicity of Scripture. The Inspiration and Canonicity of Scripture. He argues internally for canonicity, and it's beautifully done. I absolutely agree. I'll give you the real brief sketch. You look at the Old Testament. Who was the first author in the Old Testament? Moses. God affirmed Moses in front of two million plus people. He went up on the mountain. Nobody else went there. God was there. The cloud was there. The trumpet was blowing. The the fire, the smoke. God spoke the Ten Commandments. God affirmed Moses. Not one of those two million people thought, well, I don't know if Moses is really God's spokesman. Okay? They wavered afterwards because of their rebellious heart. But at the moment, not one of them doubted that. In fact, they said, don't speak, don't let God speak to us anymore. Moses, you go and you tell us what God said. So Moses is unequivocally affirmed by God as his spokesman. In Moses' writing, he lays out the criteria for those who would come later as God's authentic spokesman. Deuteronomy 13, Deuteronomy 18, he lays out the criteria. I'm just, this is a real quick sketch of the book. But but then you see immediately that prophets of God are recognized in their time, even if the people hated them because they met the criteria. And so the books were accepted by that criteria in the Old Testament times. But then you come to the New Testament and you find that Jesus, our Lord, affirmed the Hebrew scripture to be the word of God. In the Sermon on the Mount, I love preaching through that passage where he says, not one little letter, not one little distinguishing mark of a letter will pass away until all is fulfilled. He affirmed it again and again as the word of God during his ministry. In addition, Jesus affirmed his own words to be the word of God. He said in, um, in various passages that this was in fact, let's turn. Turn with me to, um, you know, in Matthew 24, he just says of his words what he said of, of uh, the Old Testament in Matthew 5, where he says, heaven and earth uh, will not pass away until my words are fulfilled. But let's look at the other text. Turn to John 12. John 12 and verse 49. He says, for I did not speak on my own initiative, but the father himself who sent me has given me a commandment as to what to say and what to speak. I know that his commandment is eternal life. Therefore, the things I speak, I speak just as the father has told me. So in unequivocal terms, Jesus claims to be presenting the words of God. Turn over to chapter 14, verse 10. Do you not believe that I in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own initiative, but the Father abiding in me does his works. Again, part of his works here are the words that he speaks, not on his own initiative, but on the Father's initiative. So what I'm showing you is it's not the church councils that bring us to believe the Scripture. It's our Lord, ultimately. It's he affirmed the Old Testament. And he affirmed, you can study it, he affirmed exactly the content that we call the Old Testament. The Hebrew Scriptures at the time. Even though they had the Septuagint, that was the Bible that, that, the, that Jesus and the apostles often used, certainly the apostles often used, um, and it included the Apocrypha, those are never affirmed to Scripture. There are a lot of ways you can, you can prove that. But they, he affirmed the, the books that we call the Old Testament. In addition, Jesus pre-authenticated the New Testament by choosing the men under whose oversight it would be written. The 11 apostles, he knew from the beginning one of the apostles was a, was a betrayer, was not a true believer, and so he chose 11 
plus Paul. Paul is affirmed by the other apostles as well as by that vision, but affirmed by the other apostles as being one of them in 2 Peter 3. And so uh, I love those passages in John. In fact, let's just glance there while you're here in John. Look at John 14, 26. But the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I said to you. This is not a promise for us. This is a promise for the 11. Jesus is saying, I taught you a lot of things while I was with you. And when the spirit comes, he's going to bring those things to your remembrance. This explains why John the apostle writing more than what? 60 years after the events, uh, somewhere between 50 and 60 years after the events of the gospels, writes a gospel. How, How did he remember all of that? Well, I'm sure it was indelibly imprinted on his mind just by the virtue of what it was. But in addition, Jesus is here promising that the Spirit would bring those things to his remembrance. Turn over to chapter 16. Chapter 16, verse 12. In addition to what I taught you, Jesus says, I have many more things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. But when he, the Spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak on his own initiative, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will disclose to you what is to come. Again, this is not a promise to us. This is a promise to the 11. In addition to bringing to their mind all that they learned under the ministry of Jesus, the Spirit was going to lead them into additional truth that the the Lord intended to teach them, but then was not the time. And then he pre-authenticated their publishing his word. Turn over to chapter 17. In the high priestly prayer here, as he prays, notice what he says in verse 20. I do not ask on behalf of these alone, that is the 11 alone, but for those also, watch this, who believe in me through their word. Jesus is here authenticating them as the publisher, both verbally and obviously eventually written, of his word. The word that he taught them, that the Spirit called to their mind, and the words that he would teach them through the Spirit after the ascension. So Jesus pre-authenticated the New Testament, not by giving us a list of books, but by giving us an inspired list of authors under whose authority the New Testament would be written. When you start looking at the apostles, there are only five New Testament books that weren't written directly by an apostle, someone identified in Scripture as an apostle. And you start looking at them, and pretty quickly you can discern that they are under the auspices of an apostle. Mark, for example, early church history is very clear that it was written under the direction of Peter. That's why it was accepted, because it was under his direction, an apostle. Luke and Acts, written under the direction of the Apostle Paul, and so forth. So you get the idea, okay? So I I think it's important as we come to study the Scripture and as we teach our people the Scripture that we make sure they're clear on these issues. What about, as we look at the big picture, what about the theme of the Bible? You may disagree with me here. Okay, that's fine. But this is where I've arrived. And I tell you where I arrived at. I I arrived at this in an exposition of John 17, the high priestly prayer of Christ. I think in that prayer, he pulls together all the strings of redemptive history, and it comes down to this. And I've chosen each of these words very carefully. God is redeeming a people by his son, for his son, to his own glory. I personally think that encapsulates all of the scripture. Uh, God, he obviously is the initiator, is, that is, the redemption is an ongoing process. It's not complete yet until we're all in our glorified bodies, until the new heavens and the new earth are in place. God is redeeming a people. God had in mind from eternity past a, a group of people that he would redeem. This is election. This is the eternal choice of God. By his son, it's all accomplished, this redemption through his son. The son is the one mediator. You know, I ask my people, so where is Christ in the Old Testament? 
Where's the first time we run into Christ in the Old Testament? What's the answer to that question? Genesis 1.1. John 1.3 says, without him, nothing was made that was made. And every, every encounter in the Old Testament that is a visible display, a visible presence of God, a theophany, I believe is a Christophany. John Walward, by the way, in his excellent book, Jesus Christ Our Lord, agrees with that. So Christ is the center of human history. Old Testament history, New Testament history, church history. God is redeeming a people by his son, for his son. Read John 17, and how often does does Jesus say, the men you, what? Gave me. We're talking about a divine transaction among the Trinity in eternity past. The men you gave me. That's why he came. That's what this is all about. That's why the church is the center of the world for our God. You ever thought about this? When God looks down upon the world and history as it's unfolding today on our planet, he cares about what's happening in the major capitals because he's sovereign over everything. He cares what's happening in the White House and the Kremlin and, you know, et cetera. But that's not the object of his attention. The object of his attention is your church and my church and every other faithful church because he's redeeming a people by his son for his son. We are the love gift of the father to the son. And this is what redemption is all about. It's bigger than us. And you know the encouragement to that to me is this is so much bigger than me. You know, I'm just swept up in in an expression of the father's love to the son. And that means my redemption is ultimately secure because I'm part of something bigger than me. God's giving me as part of a gift to his son for his own, to his own glory. Ultimately, of course, this is the sum of, a, of the reason everything exists, the glory of God. So anyway, that's, that's my stab at it. You can, you can tweak that or throw it away, but I believe you have to, when you come to the scripture, regardless, let me say this, when you come to study a passage, you have to have in mind what you think the theme of the overall scripture is. Because again, you're relating the theme of scripture and how it, it unfolds in that particular book. So if you don't like that one, come up with your own. But, but make sure you have some understanding in your own mind of what incorporates the entirety of God's revelation so that you can then compare how each book's theme relates to that overall message. The purpose of the Testaments, uh, this is just a summary. I taught my kids this. I remind my church of this occasionally. Basically, how does, the, how does each Testament relate to that overall theme? The Old Testament, he's coming and why he needs to come. The New Testament, he came, the Gospels. Acts and the Epistles, this is what his coming meant. And he's coming again, Revelation. I mean, that's, that's the scripture. And so I think it's important as you look at a given passage to relate it back to that larger context. Well, that's all we're going to do on the large context. Now we're going to get into the specific passage and, and the book we want to study. Okay.